when the gifted came along after the uh, after the pilot got picked up you know uh, the idea was i was going to supervise editor i was going to get to eat, to hire you know so i bought in i brought in the post person i mean i brought in everybody in terms of the the main post people um including the editors so when it came time to hire editors it was like well who's going to listen to me when i you know when i want to give a note on something so what i realized is i'm just going to hire all of my old assistants that are now editors because they'll at least pretend like i know what i'm talking about and won't give me too much lip I'm here today with Steve Lang, who is a Hollywood film editor and proud ACE member. And just a few of your credits include shows such as The Gifted, Preacher, Hand of God, Superstore, Rectify, and frankly, the reason that you and I are even here today talking, Burn Notice. So Steve, (laughs) as I've uh, joked about more than once, it has been a decade long quest of mine to get you on the other end of this microphone and you're finally here. (laughs) Hollywood, thank you so much for being here. Absolutely, man. It, it, it's a pleasure. It's it's one of those. There's a, there's a reason why I'm in a dark room all the time. Is, is I, I normally don't like to uh, to talk too much, but uh, but for you, I will always make an exception. And I appreciate that. And I was just going to allude to the fact that getting you out in any form of the public, even a Zoom call from your own home, <laughs> is like pulling teeth. I saw you at one event last year, which was the the Ace Holiday Party, and I'm like. That's got to be a hologram. That can't actually be seen <laughs> in public amongst other human beings. So Amongst other edit- editors, too. Amongst it's other editors on top of that. Um, so, yes, it's, it's great to have you here. And if people are wondering, well, how do I not know about Steve? That's why. And I'm hoping to change that because I don't think that you have uh, you've been able to provide – as much value and knowledge and brilliance out into the, the larger world. I know you've done it on an individual level on your shows with your assistants, with your other editors, but there's a lot of value you can bring to this community. And I'm hoping you can bring a little bit of that today as I pulled you out of your shell, um, mm-hmm. out of your comfort zone to, to be on the other end of the microphone. So where I want to start is the beginning of our story. I have told what I call the burn notice story at least a hundred times and for my regular listeners, they're like, oh, my God, the burn notice story again. <laughs> However, the story has never been told from your point of view. And I think understanding it from your point of view is so important because when I tell it, it's all about how I broke in, how I got your attention, how I proved myself, how I got the job on the show. But I think it's even more important to, gr- uh, it's even more important to crawl into your brain to know what that looked like from your perspective so other people can understand, how do I get noticed if I really want to work on something that I'm passionate about but I might not be qualified for, or I'm just looking for mentorship from somebody that I admire, what does it look like from that person's perspective? So talk to me about the very first time, according to your memory at least, that you and I first connected. Um, if I remember correctly, it was a it was a Facebook thing, right? You sent me a message through it was a messenger, right? On, on Facebook, it was the very first time we connected was a Facebook message, which to you looked like one message. From my perspective, was Facebook stalking every single person that worked on the show. <laughs> but to you, you're like, oh, I got a message. So yes, the first time we met was a Facebook message. Yeah. So I mean, it, you know, what's interesting is obviously you weren't, you know, you're not the first person to sort of reach out to me. And, you know, I, I'm, I am one of those guys, if you sort of take the time and you reach out, uh, I, I, you know, most of the time I will respond with some sort of message or advice. And, you know, uh, usually, you know, obviously I'm, I, I work a lot, I'm busy a lot, but I also know, you know, when I started out, you know, I mean, I had a lot of people that sort of helped me along the way. So it's just one of those things where, you know, I, I always feel like it's, it's one of the ways for me to sort of to give back. So when I get those messages, um, I might not respond right away, but you know, I usually respond with uh, with something. And I, re- like I said, I remember you wanting to sort of get together uh, because you were, you know, trying to make the uh, the transition. And I I do remember you talking about at the time you had a was it was it a trailer sort of company or. 
what, you were doing promo stuff. Yeah, I had, I had, had sort to, of, I had built a boutique post production facility that exactly. was doing a combination of long form and short form, where I had a small group of independent contractors that were working with me. Where a client would hire me, but because the workload was so high, I would uh, basically, you know, subcontract other editors. I would supervise them, and we would do both trailers, promos, featurettes, and some long form work. And it was actually the web series feature film that I was working on that I used to get your attention. So that was where it all started was I had sent you the trailer for it. Exactly. And and like I said, I remember being intrigued because I, you know, like I said, it was, I I thought the trailer was, was really well done. It, you know, it reminded, it reminded me of burn notice in a lot of way. And, you know, this is where the sort of luck aspect of it uh, comes along is, you know, we were looking for an editor at the time because I believe Matt, uh, got his other series and I knew I was going to go do that. And so it was a, a question of who was going to sort of replace me um, while, while I was sort of working on that. So originally I believe it was just going to be like for maybe a half a season or something. So there were, you know, there were a few combination of things that were just sort of like uh, perfect, you know, perfect sort of timing. Um, I was intrigued by your situation. And I, I remember just thinking, no, I was kind of curious, like what, what your setup was in terms of this this house that you had and and all of that stuff because I'm you know I you know I, I can get geeked out by some of the technical aspects of it all too. So uh, like I said, I remember coming to your facility and us just sitting down and having a conversation. And you know, I mean, the minute I kind of walked into the facility, it was like, okay, this guy's for real. Like you know, obviously, most of the 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 uh, the emails or you know, messages that I get, they're, they're, they're mostly young, you know, younger people trying to figure out how to break in with almost no credits, you know, those are sort of almost the easier conversations to to have because, you know, I mean, when you've got nothing, it's like, okay, you know, here's sort of a playbook, playbook of, you know, from assistance that I've suggested before that really seems to work, you know, um, with you, it was like, it was more of a, you know, I, I'm a working editor. I'm just trying to make that transition into scripted, which, you know, like everything can be, you know, can be difficult, you know? So, um, but I remember just sitting down and having that, that, that conversation with you and right away saying, okay, this guy is like for real, like it's really just a matter of of an opportunity. So, you know, I I remember you gave me a, a DVD. I, I don't remember if there was a few episodes on it or what it was, but I watched it and it was just like, okay, this, this is a no brainer. Like, you know, like this guy knows exactly the style of the show in a way that, you know, that a is going to make my life easier because, you, you know, uh, at that point I had a relationship with the, with the guys there that it was like, you know, they expected, you know, they expected a lot. And, you know, I, I wanted to make sure they hired somebody that, that really could sort of pull it off. So, uh, you know, so very quickly, it was just one of those. I mean, I remember walking in with the, with the DVD and just said, don't even waste your time like watch this and hire this guy and you'll be fine you know now granted you still had to go in there and you had to uh to interview and you had to impress them and that you did so you know uh you know what i mean like it's not as simple as me just saying hire this guy although it was probably 90 percent. i mean you literally had to just screw that one up in a way that <laughs> that that they wouldn't have hired you but but then the rest was history because like because I remember you were supposed to do a half a season. We ended up getting a full season pickup, so you stayed. And then I remember the season after that, it was like I am not coming back to Burn Notice unless we have three editors. And and then that was you know, and then that's basically how it sort of continued. I love hearing the story from your perspective because there are multiple details I wasn't even aware of until right now. And there are, there are a couple of pieces of this I want to dissect even a little bit further that I think are going sure. to have really important takeaways for the listener. The way that I saw it from my perspective and the story that I've told, you played it really close to the vest because I had no idea you were already looking for somebody so early and that you were kind of quasi interviewing me behind the scenes. Because when I had reached out, we just set up a lunch and you said you wanted to see the setup and I gave you a quick uh, tour of the house that I had rented and built out into a post facility and we just chatted. I wasn't trying to pitch myself. I wasn't saying, hey, I hear you have an opening. I want the job. I just wanted to learn. I was just seeking advice to understand how does the machine work? How do you break into TV? What are they looking for? So it was more understanding your story rather than, hey, I'm here. I want to pitch myself. At least that's how I remember it. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't remember pitching myself. 
Well, yeah, it wasn't that that you necessarily were pitching yourself, but it was like, like I said, I know you were tr- you were trying to break into scripted, and you know, and obviously, you know, I mean, uh, you know, uh, for someone like you that's already has experience, who's in theory making a living doing it, you know, it's it's a lot easier when you know you're you're trying to be an assistant, and it's you know, and it's you're coming from sort of nowhere because it's like you know, there's, you know, at the time I believe you already had a family, right? Uh, or uh, I was were just you, about to have my first son. So I, yeah. I, so my wife was pregnant. Yeah. So those are, you know, those are nervous ones, you know what I mean? Meaning, you know, like, you know, like I, I love giving advice, but it's like to say, you got to stop, you know, doing what you're doing and you've got to step into, or you got to step down into an assistant position to, you know what I mean? To kind of, to, to, to get the, uh, the opportunity to then start editing you know, uh, scripted because that's that's sort of the reality of how, you know, of how that process would normally work for someone. You know, if you want to say you're coming from the reality, you know, from the reality world, trying to get into the scripted world, you usually almost have to take a step back before you can sort of step, you know, step up. So, you know, for someone like you, you know, I mean, you know, I I saw the immense talent in terms of the the material that you sent me, and and like I said, at the end of the day, it really was. The perfect timing because the reality is if we weren't looking for someone and i i, I don't remember was it right was it was it right away that that we that we ended up hiring no th- or, this is the other part that uh, that i didn't yeah, even cover until just now um when we originally met i had no idea there were any opportunities i wasn't pitching myself i just wanted to learn what does it look I like i do remember yeah and i do remember not telling you like in the back of my you head didn't tell me anything was, i knew yeah nothing. i, I I, I, I do remember like, because I didn't want to get you like excited in a way that, you know, I mean, who like, you know, it was one of those, I wanted to have a conversation. I really, you know, I wanted to look at the material, you know, and, and so it wasn't just like, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to make this happen. It was, let me just make sure this guy is sort of okay. Yeah. Know? So the, the timeline from my perspective, we had lunch at the end of the lunch. I do remember handing you the DVD very politely, very sheepishly. Hey, if you wouldn't mind, there, this web series had just finished. If you'd look at the first couple of episodes and as a web series, it was like 15 minutes worth total between two yeah, episodes. Yeah. You said you'd look at it and like a week or two later, you called me and you're like, dude, what is this thing? Like, this is awesome. Like, this is a really, really cool show. And you wanted to know more about the show specifically, but that was it. So I talked Mm. a little bit more about the show, the workflow, how I got the job. And then I will never forget this. It's one of my most distinct LA memories. I was getting gas at the 76 station at the corner of Sepulveda. I don't remember the name of the street, but it's right next to the 405. And you called and you're like, hey, I just wanted to let you know that I'm going to be going on to a pilot for Matt Nix. We're going to need somebody to fill my spot for one episode. So I didn't even know until today that it was for half the season. You said we need a fill in for one episode. And I want to see if I can get you an interview. And you really downplayed it. Like, listen, you don't really have the credits. Um, I just, I want to give you the opportunity to meet with them. But we've got a lot of other people to meet. And I I think that uh, afterwards, Alfredo had said they met with guys that worked on 24 and Heroes and all these other big shows. But as soon as you said the opening was there, I said, this job is mine. <laughs> this is made for me. And then I remember watching the – at the time – I remember you binged. I remember you like – you watched Three everything. seasons yeah. twice. I watched all yeah, three yeah. seasons twice. And as you know, when I came in, I became the rain man of Burn Notice. You yeah, or yeah. Eric or Alfredo would say, hey, what was that one episode where, uh, you know, um, this character does this? Oh, that's, uh, yeah, episode 311, um, uh, end of act three, uh, four, four shots before the cut to black. Right? I just, yeah. I, I remember everything. But I remember going in really thinking that you downplayed it. And then oh, I, I definitely downplayed it. That would that would be me for sure, is definitely just downplaying it. This way, you know, if, if it worked out fantastic – but if it didn't, it's like no big deal. You know? Yeah. So I, I went in, I had the meeting with Alfredo, who was the, the second in command under Matt Nix at the time. Uh, and he's he's a tough cookie. When I look back oh, at yeah. this in hindsight and I look at the level of experience I had and how young I was, what was I doing there? Like I'm now coaching people that were my age when I got the job on burn notice and they, they look like kids. I'm like, I know. that was me. Like what, how <laughs> in the world did that come together? But the, the story that Matt Nix told me, was similar to what you said, where you handed them the, the DVD reel and they put it in. And I think it was him and uh, Jason. They looked at each other after like 15 or 20, 20 seconds. They're like, hired? Hired. Good. <laughs> which, is, and which is funny because uh, uh, when you talk about like 
people that sort of, you know, uh, 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 are looking out for you. I mean, that's how I, I got the job on Burn Notice. You know, I had worked with Alfredo on one or two other shows previously. So he was the guy that introduced me to Matt Nix. And it wasn't even like, it wasn't even an interview. Like Alfredo was like, you're hiring this guy. It's not even like, this is, this is a no brainer. So, you know, I mean, th those are the things that I always think about and remember when I get these emails or when I get the calls and in terms of people just looking for advice and opportunities, because if somebody wasn't looking out for me, you know, things wouldn't have necessarily happened. Exactly. So there, there were a lot of confluence of events that all made this come together. The one piece from my perspective that I always tell people, very little of this was lucky or was an accident because I had a sniper scope pointed at this show. It wasn't a matter of I sent you a message and 50 other people on 50 other shows I said, if sure. there's one other show where I'm a shoe in and I can walk in and cut it tomorrow morning, it's burn notice. So I'm going to target <laughs> that one and I'm going to become obsessed with it. And clearly it worked out, but it's all about being specific because if I just been some guy that you liked that you wanted to help, I don't think you would have taken that reel and given it to Alfredo and Matt and said, this guy's got to cut the show because I wouldn't have been the right fit. No, no, absolutely not. Yeah, absolutely not. So I've, it's really important that people are so specific about this is where I can set myself up for success as opposed to I really, really, really want it. You got to look at it from the other person's perspective. Doesn't even make sense because sure. ultimately your ass was on the line. You can't just hand me over. And then I edit my first episode, which, by the way, was the directorial debut of the star of the show. I found that out like two days after getting hired. Alfredo was like, oh, by the way, this is going to be my episode. I'm going to be executive producing this one. And Jeffrey's going to be directing it. Oh, cool. Jeffrey who? He's like, Jeffrey Donovan. Like, what, no, no. You mean, you mean the, the star of the show? He's like, yeah, you're going to be cutting that one. The pressure that I had, I just had my first kid. I was still sure. running a business. And in my mind, I had one episode. That was it. I had five yeah. weeks to either make it in television or have it never be a realized dream. So that was a long five weeks for me. <laughs> um, but, you know, it paid off. And four seasons later, you and I finished out the series together. Absolutely. So now I want to talk more about you. This is a, a story that I've always wanted to see from both ends, uh, both ends of the, the story. But when it comes to you, you also have a very circuitous route to get where you are today. Everybody mm. thinks in order to, to make it in TV – First, you got to be a PA, then you got to be an assistant editor. You pay your dues for years and years and years, and maybe somebody hands you a few scenes to cut, and then you get to edit. And if I look at your resume, as far as just the credits alone, makes no sense whatsoever. There, uh, you, are, you are the polar opposite of being pigeonholed, but if I look <laughs> at the roles that you have played, you are also the polar opposite of being pigeonholed. So take me back to your origin story of breaking into TV. But so my origin story, oh my God. So I mean it I mean, I started I started the normal path, right? Meaning, uh, you know, I was lucky to get a job at a production company um, that owned their own avid system, right? So this was, you know, uh, I think that was around ninety three or something like that, maybe ninety four. So uh, you know, it was that digital transition, which I mean, God, you know, those are those things where you realize, oh, you know, I was young enough to be excited. And obviously, there were a lot of older editors that just were so not uh, excited or interested. But what was great is they owned their own editing system, which you know basically gave me the opportunity to just jump on and learn. And it was the type of place where, after hours, weekends, I could do whatever I want. The, the, the facility was was mine. So you know, I literally, you know, me and my friends would shoot projects, and nobody knew how to edit and. Basically, I was the guy that was kind of like, okay, uh, let, let me try and figure this out. So, you know, I got a couple of lessons. Um, the production company I was working at was uh, Robert Greenwald Productions. They did a lot of uh, television movies at the time. So uh, what the way that you got sort of promoted there is, you know, you kind of, you know, you were PA, you, you did all the running, you did all the, the grunt work, the research. Uh, the shopping and, and, you know, and eventually they would give you an opportunity to assist on one of their TV movies because they, a lot of that stuff was non-union. And I had two friends that sort of went through that process and all of a sudden they, they kind of had these, these uh, 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 editing careers or assisting editing careers. So, uh, so they were looking for somebody. I jumped on the opportunity. Unfortunately, it was sort of that period where the, uh, the television movie industry was kind of starting to, 
to die out those those TV movies. So, it, you know, I'd been there for almost like three or four years and it was a little bit like, ooh, you know, like I I'd get some opportunities to go, you know, work on a PA, like on a, you know, on a TV series or a movie. And, you know, you're like, oh, should I just, you know, should I hold out? Should I, should I, uh, you know, or should I just, it's not going to happen here. I mean, thank God I, I, I knew better in terms of the holding out because when I first moved out, uh, I was really, I really wanted to do the writing thing. Um, you know, wrote some scripts, uh, uh, got a little bit of interest in terms of agent and almost got into the Warner Brothers uh, writing program. And they had their sitcom writing program. But at the same time, I was starting to play around in the editing room, just, you know, basically kind of learning. And I caught myself, uh, you know, I used to say like, I was good and disciplined in terms of being able to sit down and write. And I, you know, I do, I go get two, three hours, you know, and then I just get a little antsy and then, you know, my day was sort of like, okay, I'm, I'm done writing. But when I was, when I was editing, it was like, oh my God, like 10, 12 hours literally just went by blink of an eye. Didn't even think about it really just kind of enjoying the process of what it, you know, what it was that I was kind of creating. So, you know, it was one of those where, I, you know, I could quickly realize, thank God that like, oh shit, this is like a, a real career path. And I think this is something that I, I'm really sort of comfortable in and I want to, I want to hold out, you know? So, uh, and I'll try to get through this as quick as possible. The uh, production company could see that I was kind of growing frustrated and they were sort of, uh, 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 they, they knew too that there really wasn't too much coming down the pike. So uh, uh, Robert Greenwald uh, actually had a movie, an independent movie that he was doing at the time. And he said, hey, Steve, uh, do me a favor. Can you assist um, this actor? Uh, I, you know, I think he might be a little bit of trouble. Um, you know, he's got a little bit of a reputation. So I, you know, so I was like, uh, sure, whatever you want me to do. Ended up being uh, Russell Crowe. Um, so wow. I got this, you know, so I got this great opportunity uh, and I got to sort of step into that world of it, completely op- obvious other side, but just in terms of just seeing what that like the the set world was like, what it was in terms of you know the de- the what the demand was in terms of a leading actor. And this was like be- this was right before he did L.A. Confidential. So at the time, you know, he had done uh, Virtuosity, he had done uh, quick in the dead, you know, nothing like, you know, no, no big breakout things, but I, but it was always one of those things like he's going to be the next big thing, next big thing. Um, very, you know, it was one of those things were really open, you know what I mean? Like, you know, once I sort of stepped into that world, I mean, I was a young guy and uh, the, the amount of questions that I, I would just hit him with on a constant basis, I, I, I can't even believe that he would sort of, you know, put, put up with, with any of that. When I think about that stuff now, but uh, at the end of that process, it was it was probably about three months that I was working with him. You know, he would call me up because uh, you know he, he we, we sort of got along. So now there was a potential opportunity to be his assistant. You know, um, at the time he just started doing LA Confidential. But I mean, I really you know I would talk to him about I, I want to be an editor. I, I got to get into that room. And you know, so I I remember turning him down, and then and then boom, I finally got that the television movie came in and they, you know, and they talked to the editor and the editor said, you know, they said, Hey, you got to hire this guy. If he, you know, if he sucks, you know I mean? You can fire him. But, uh, but, but then it started, you know, like I, uh, Peter Ellis was his name, you know, one of the you know best sort of mentors that I, that I, that I've had. Um, and the director was uh, Michael uh, Watkins and, from there, we, you know, we just, the three of us hit it off. And next thing you know, we're, you know, we did another movie together. We did a TV series together. And, you know, and then from there, it just sort of, it kind of built, built and built, you know. The curious thing about your resume, however, is when I look at it, I don't see assistant editor to editor. I see post-production supervisor, associate producer, co-producer. Yes. You have been all over the map, and I don't think I know anyone else in this entire industry that's done all the jobs. You've so, done them all. Uh, okay, and, and and you know what? You know, there's a world. There's a part of me that has a little bit of a chip on my shoulder, only because you know I graduated with a, a business degree in business management. Like the film industry was something that you know that I, I mean, I always wanted to be a part of it. I just wasn't sure how, how exactly I was going to 
get into it because you know film school you know financially wasn't an option for me obviously i was lucky enough to live in uh, I, I grew up on long island you know so the city was an option so as i was sort of going to school you know i started do you know i i i, I go into the city i do extra work on on movies and just kind of got sort of an understanding i started getting into the writing aspect and i always thought that was going to you know be my angle so when I got out, you know, like I said, everything I did was sort of self-taught, no real connections or any of that stuff. But uh, but I was lucky enough, uh, Joe Berger Davis, who was a post producer who I worked with on my first TV series, he called me up um, uh, after that one was over because uh, David Kelly was looking for an assistant on the practice, uh, which at the time was, you know, in its first, I think it was, they just finished their first season you know, it was one of those, you know, obviously David Kelly had a great reputation. The show didn't really, hadn't really done too much. Um, but I met with them and it was, you know, a great group of people, you know, and it was one of those like, oh, I, I definitely want to do this. Um, uh, all of a sudden that show just exploded. So it was really like the second TV show I'd ever, I, I, I had done. And uh, after that second season, I think we, we it won Best Emmy. Uh, you know, best drama, and then it won the best drama the, the season after that, and then it was one of those crazy like got a five season pickup, right? So obviously at that time, with you know, you know, you you had a post uh, a post production place that was like there was no editor leaving, you know, what I mean, like it was it was one of the best jobs you could sort of ask for, and you know, I sort of made a nice you know reputation for myself there. I was doing a lot of uh, cutting the. Uh, the previous songs, the next songs, the editor, uh, Charles McClellan, you know, he would let me cut scenes all the time. So, you know, it was, I was getting a lot of good sort of training, but, you know, started to get frustrated in the sense that I would get calls about some opportunities, but I'd have to be willing to leave. And so what ended up happening is I got this great opportunity to, to assist on a Spielberg series that they said if the pilot got picked up, I would then be able to uh, get one of those editing chairs. And Peter Ellis, who I'd worked with, you know, back in the day, you know, he was he's he was the the, the pilot editor with Michael Watkins again. You know, one, like I said, these these connections they never really go away, especially if you if you're good, you know. So um, so I let them know this is my opportunity, you know. So they got, you know, they got a little nervous and they just said, hey, we know you're a little bit, you know, frustrated. Um, so, uh, here, you know, here's an opportunity. Um, uh, we need somebody to kind of do the video side of, of, of post-production. Um, would, you know, would that sort of satisfy you in terms of just, you know, we're going to let you, the next time there's an editing chair open, it's yours, but we want to just, you know, we don't, we want you to sort of feel like you're growing and you're doing things, you know? Um, ultimately that, that pilot I worked on didn't get picked up, you know? Um, so, uh, you know, so I, I ended up going back and then doing the video side of it for a season. And then the next season, you know, still uh, actually the next season, the, the editing chair opens up and they say, and so now they dangle and they mm. say, you can, you can have the editing chair, or we would love for you to run post productions. So, I mean, it was you know it was a tough one because at that time you know at that point I was you know probably five I was probably waiting about five years you know in terms of getting that sort of opportunity and man it was right in front of me. And, I mean, as much as they offered it to me, it was one of those like we really want you to do this, but if you want to do this, you know we'll, we'll let you. So, you know. I was intrigued because I did see, you know, the way, uh, uh, you know, Dave, like I always say, David, the David E. Kelly company, that was basically my film school, you know, like they, the way they gave people opportunities was always, you know, and, you know, people that started off as, you know, in post, in terms of running post, you know, they were directed, you know, so it was one of those things where it was like, it was too good of an opportunity to say no. But I, what I worked out was, hey, I'll run post, but you have to let me edit one episode a season. So I was kind of getting the best of both worlds, you know, like I, you know, I got to sort of learn all that sort of side and aspect of it, but I also got to, con you know, continue to get editing credits and sort of give myself that opportunity uh, to, you know, down the road where I could make, you know, like I said, I could market myself in a way that, you know, I could go in either direction if I, 
I ultimately wanted to. But I will say this, the minute that show was over, uh, I never went back. It was like, you know, the, I, I like to get my hands dirty, you know, the running post fantastic, but it's, it's a lot of babysitting, you know, like, and I, I like to get my hands dirty. So that's, that was kind of a no brainer, you know, once, once I was done there. I definitely want to talk about the myriad of shows that you have cut since then. But before we go forwards and talk more about the editing side of your career, I do want to talk to the only person that I know that has been both a high level editor and a high level co-producer that's run departments. What are the things that happen on the production side or the post-production side that editors just don't get? The things that editors just are driven crazy by and you're like, yeah, but dude, you don't get it. What are the things that we on our side of the fence need to better understand so we can all coexist? Because as you know, the structure of our departments, it's not the most brilliant way that uh, departments are structured. If you look at uh, all the other departments, well, let's, let's yeah. use the camera department, for example. I don't know the exact uh, order of it, but like you get to do the slate. Then you get to be a third AC, then a second AC, mm-hmm. then a first AC, then a cameraman. Then you get to be a DP someday. But if you're a DP, you've done the job of everybody below you. But in post-production, the co-producer has most likely never touched an avid in their life and they've never edited. And I've just never understood why the person that's running everything has never done the job. Because I – How about these two things? Yeah, I know. I I mean, let's put it this way. If you really did those jobs, you would never – I don't think you ever really want to, you know, in terms of actually running post. Because like I said, it really is, you know, you're dealing with studios, you're dealing with networks. Now, I, I do have to preface. Being in Kellyland is not like being in a normal sort of uh, post world because, uh, for the most part, money was no, there. Was, money was no object. Like you know, obviously, I had to get permission. I had to let people know in terms of what was going on, but there was a lot of money flowing in a way that you know that that didn't you know it it never hindered you know so i get you know when i'm working for you know a place and i get you got to get the studio approval for the overtime you got to do this like none of that stuff really you know like you know the thing that that when i talk about the babysitting like if you were in that post-production if you were an editor on that show i will say it's you know i mean it's easy to look back at it now but at the time it was such a, it was such a cushy gig, you know I mean? Like, yes, the hours could be late and, you know, you'd have to do the weekend works. And by the time you got to the end of the season, because they would always squeeze out one or two more episodes since it was such a popular show. Like we were literally finishing on a Friday, locking on a Monday, I mean, locking on a Wednesday and airing on a Sunday. Like that's how tight it was, which means three editors working on one episode you know, being able to pop into each of these rooms, uh, you know, one, you know, each, each editor had their own act. I mean, it it was such a, I mean, it was a well-oiled machine, but it was also just crazy, crazy intense, you know, but they took care of you in a way that, you know, you know, you you always sort of felt grateful uh, for it. But, uh, but yes, I, you know, I can get frustrated all the time when it comes to the sort of financial aspects of it. Um, but from the creative aspect of it, like, I don't even, you know, it's like, I mean, and, you know, obviously, you know, we've both been there, you know, there's, there's only so much I can do, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I problem solve, you know, you're, the, jo- the main job, point, point of the job is just, you're problem solving all the time. Sometime that problem solving is going to make me, you know, it, it drives me crazy where, like I said, my, my hours are going to go a little bit crazy. Do I, you know, I can ask for, I, I ask for, you know, permission to get that over time or there's times where I just going to do it because I, I don't even want to deal with the hassle of it. You know, obviously I try, you know, I, you know, when I'm working on my editor's cut, my cut, you know what I mean? I don't necessarily mind doing the hours, but beyond that, then those are the times where, you know what I mean? I I'll step up and make sure that I'm being taken care of and my assistant's taken care of because, those are the times where, you know what I mean, where I shouldn't be on my time. It should be on somebody else's time. Yeah, and I have the exact same philosophy where if I want to make it better, that's kind of sort of on me and I need to put in the time. But once I've handed in my cut and it's up to other people's notes, other people's schedules, other people's responsibilities, when you need something done faster and you're saying you can't pay me, your lack of poor planning and your lack of ability to manage time and money, that's not my emergency. That's yours. Sure. 
you need me, that's fine. I'm willing to provide my services, but my services have a cost. And that's Absolutely. a really hard conversation for most people to have. And you, you're like, that's hard for people, really? Like, I, you're like me. You're like, dude, you're not getting a minute of my time unpaid. That's really hard for a lot of people to do that. And they put themselves through the long nights and the weekends secretly, even when it's other people's uh, the needs and requests and schedules and it's not their fault at all. That really frustrates me because I know you and I are like, dude, what are you doing? I know. But I mean, but, you know, a lot of that, like I said, because I can remember early in my career, you know, I mean, I, you know, it was more just like, oh, my God, do, what the fuck am I doing here? I, do I know what I'm doing here? Like, so, you know, the, the longer you do it, the, I think the confidence, you know, the confidence in terms of what you bring to the project. And ultimately, like I said, these relationships that you, you know, when you're con when they're constantly calling you to work on something, you know, what I mean, then, you know, you know, they're trusted, you're trusted in a way that. You know, you know, you deserve to get you deserve to get paid for for what you're doing. Now I want to transition to finishing the practice. You have a few editing credits under your belt. You also have producing credits. From there yeah. until this very moment, where you've been the supervising lead editor on multiple shows now for Matt Nix. There's this yeah. giant grouping of credits that make no sense whatsoever. <laughs> you've done everything. Every genre, every and the, type, different network, straight, like it, it makes no sense, but it does the, if you if you can discuss what you know. I'm just going to let you go ahead because you you clearly yeah. Just I mean, listen, it, you know, it's somewhat it is somewhat by design, you know, and and you know, it's when you talk about the pigeonhole thing, it was something I was very I was conscious about, but caught myself like falling into, you know what I mean? Like it wasn't, it wasn't easy, you know, cause it, you know, all of a sudden it was just like, Hey, I love watching half hour shows. Like when I'm not working, I catch myself watch, watching more half hour comedies than I'm doing, you know, one hour action dramas or lawyer shows, which were obviously you do the practice, you're going to get lawyer shows. You know, I, I did some cop stuff, burn notice, all of a sudden, you know, you're getting these sort of action shows. And, you know, the the one thing I kept getting is, oh my God, you're going to love this. This is just like burn notice. And it's like, of course, internally, I'm like, I have no interest in it if it's just like burn notice. Like, you know, you, like anything, you want to sort of grow and, you know, and you're, you're kind of curious on, on some of these uh, other genres. So the question is, how do I navigate that? How do I get there? Because you know how it is. They look at the resume and they say, should I hire the guy that has absolutely no half hour experiences, you know, credits to his name, or should I hire this guy that has a million half hour experiences, you know, credits to his name? So, you know, that's where, and like I said, and once again, you fall back on those relationships because, you know, Matt Nix, who, you know, I've had this great relationship with him for, for a while, you know, hired a writer, had a writer, uh, Ben Wexler, uh, who, you know, who, who I love to this day and was one of those guys that, you know, and you get this a lot, obviously when you work on shows, when I get my show, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to hire you, you know, and it's always like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah great, great. I, I'm, I can't wait, you know, to, to work with you, you know? And, you know, at the time when I was trying to, to kind of, you know, trying to like, I, you know, hold out, hold out, you know, see if I could break into that sort of half hour world, all of a sudden, an opportunity uh, an opportunity opened up because uh, Ben ended up getting a show. Him and Matt did a this half hour show uh, with Larry Charles, which was the, the Billy Crystal Josh Gad one on FX. And of course, it was like I want to do this so bad, you know. Uh, Larry Charles, you know, obviously uh, uh, the director, one of those outside the box guys that you're just like, there's no way this guy is going to hire me because you know, what I mean, like I. I don't have, you know, I don't have the the credits he's going to be looking for. But of course, you know, you know, Ben and Matt, I, I said, you, you know, you got to get me, got to get me the, the meeting, got to get me the meeting. And, and of course, you know, I walk into that meeting and, and it, meeting and it's like, you know, you know, very quickly, you know, I, I just throw it out on the table in the sense that I go, listen, you know, cause I, I remember him picking up my resume and looking at it and it was like, oh, I might as well just walk out right now. And so, of course, you know, I, I say to him, you know, I know you're not seeing what you what you want to see here, but understand, you know, this is a genre that I, you know, that I love. And, you know, and I tried to be specific and he he stopped me very quickly and he said, um, he says, I know comedy. He's like, I'm looking for someone with a different perspective, you know, and it was it was one of those things where it was like, oh, my God. 
I think there's a shot here. You know what I mean? Like for him, you know, to, for him to be able to, and that's why like, I, you know, I, I love him is cause like I said, he's one of those guys who's so outside the box, you know, that, you know what I mean? Like normally you would get the, I need to, I need my comedy guy. I need my comedy guy. It's like, nah, he's like, I, I just wanted somebody with a different sort of perspective, you know? And then once we started talking about the script, it, 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 it felt easy in there, but I got it. You know what I mean? So all of a sudden it was like, Oh, I, you know, now I'm a, like literally one, I did one, one season of, of that. And all of a sudden now I'm a half hour guy because, you know, the superstore people saw that and they, you know, everyone loves Larry Charles. He hired this guy. So, you know, and then it's like, and then next thing I know, I'm doing a bunch of, of half hours. So, you know, and then it was like, you know, it did a horror genre half hour, you know, I mean, so, it, you know, like I said, it was one of those things where, it was one of those, like, it's never going to happen. Then all of a sudden it happened. And and now it's like, I try and keep that momentum where I try and go back and forth to sort of remind people that, oh, I can do this or I, I can do that. And I feel like I've gotten to that point where I have that, that flexibility now, which is, which is nice, you know, which it, it really is. But it, like I said, it was, it wasn't easy. And it's, you know, it's like anything, you know, uh, I mean, I could be very comfortable doing one hour, uh action shows for the rest of my career but you know at a certain point it's you know you, you do like to push yourself and 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 uh and look for those opportunities you're like me you get bored really easily four <laughs> seasons of burn notice i'm like this was awesome i'm good i'm i'm ready to, to try a different challenge and then i ended up going to glee and going to empire and then i'm like i've done the music thing i'm good Moving on, sure. right? So you're like me in that you constantly want to learn and be challenged and not fall into the, well, here's the formula. Yep, just put the pieces together. It's the same thing. Like, even as amazing as Burn Notice was, you get to the point where you're like, oh, man, another box montage? Really? <laughs> like, another one of these? I've done. I've had Michael building a bomb like 27 times already. I know. But like yeah. I said, those are those, those are those relationships, too, though, that like – you know, if it wasn't Matt Nix, I, I wouldn't have stayed for as long as I did. You know, like you just you have certain understandings with people that it's like, you know, uh, like there's a comfortableness. And like I said, it's it's a relationship that's continued because we have, you know, he knows what I sort of want and need when I work on a series. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll sort of jump back into the mentoring ship because when the gifted came along after the uh, after the pilot got picked up, you know, uh, the idea was I was going to supervise editor. I was going to get to eight, to hire, you know, so I bought in, I brought in the post person. I mean, I brought in everybody in terms of the, the main post people, um, including the editors. So when it came time to hire editors, it was like, well, who's going to listen to me when I, you know, when I want to give a note on something. So what I realized is I'm just going to hire all of my old assistants that are now editors because they'll at least pretend like I know what I'm talking about <laughs> and won't give me too much lip. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's what I, you know, that's what I sort of ended up doing there. You know? Well, one of the things that I want to extract that's so important when it comes to both what you did to decide that I want to make these, these different genre transitions. And it actually comes back to without me knowing it, the strategy that I used to get on burn notice originally, people are looking for two things. The most likely thing they want is experience. I look at the paper. The paper tells me you're the perfect fit. My ass is covered. If they don't work out, it's their fault and not mine because I hired the person that makes sense on paper. The sure. other area that I feel so few people don't have the confidence is saying I might not have the experience, but I have the ability. I've got mm. the skills to do this well. That's what you did with Larry Charles, and that's what yeah. I did with Alfredo because Alfredo yeah. had told me after our meeting, he's like, there was nobody else we interviewed. They could just sit in the chair on day one and cut burn notice. We didn't have to train you. All you had to do was get the job, and we knew you didn't have the experience, but you just knew how to cut the show down to the act outs and the effects and the box sequences. We'd have to train other people. So my skills are what got me there, not the experience, but people are so hell bent on thinking I have to have the experience, and they get caught in the catch 22. Well, I got to get sure. the job to have the experience, but I need the experience to get the job. And you focus on skills in order to start making that transition, not just, well, this is what's on paper, so you get what you get. And you address sure. that elephant in the room head on, which takes courage, but it's so important. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the other thing that we haven't talked about yet, my guess is you probably said no more than once to opportunities that would further pigeonhole you, correct? Oh, I mean, I you know, to this day, I think I still, I still do that. I mean – 
you know, I'm lucky that, you know, I get, I get to work, you know, I get to work a lot, you know, I mean, I get the calls and opportunities. It also gives me the opportunities to be, you know, selective in the sense that what I choose to do or not to do. You know, there's certain people like Matt Nix, you know, who will call me up and it's like, you know, nine times out of 10, I'm not going to say no to him. You know, I mean, obviously it always, it, it depends, but I mean, you know, there's certain people that I get excited when I get those calls. Cause I know, you know, I know what I'm sort of getting myself into. Um, but yes, um, you know, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, a good example, uh, you had uh, James Wilcox, you know, uh, when I got the call for uh, uh, the Ron Howard uh, TV series, the the genius one, you know, I mean, like I had already committed to Matt Nix uh, doing the, the X-Men pilot with Brian Singer. So it was, you know, it was one of those where, uh, you know, when I get those calls, when they say, hey, we want you to come in and meet, you know, if I can't, if I can't do it, I always like to recommend somebody, you know, someone who I think, oh, this might be a, a good fit. So it was one of those situations where it was like, hey, you know, obviously it's Ron Howard, like who the hell's going to say no to no to this. But unfortunately, I, I'm already committed to something. But I think you guys should meet, you know, uh, James Wilcox. I, I think you're going to like him, you know, and and sure enough, you know, James went in there and 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 got it, you know, and and, and established this relationship with Ron now. So and now those are those things Ron's where features. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, oh, yeah, you, you think didn't about even mention that. <laughs> but uh, but I mean, say, but those are those like you know, those are those things where I I do catch my. I mean, I, I'm always constantly trying to share. Like I I always feel like there's a lot of got, there's a lot of good opportunities out there. You know, and, you know, and if I can be, if I can help somebody get a job, to me, I, it's almost as just as satisfying as, you know, as sometimes getting the job itself. You know what I mean? Like I, their successes are always, I take that as my successes. And I do that with my assistants too. Like, you know, I mean, every time, you know, they get, you know, an assistant that moves on and gets an editing, you know, position, like I, I, that to me is one of the best feelings, you know, you can have when, when you see them sort of succeed and beyond, you know? Now, I'm definitely one of those names on the list. I uh, uh, very, very much appreciate everything that you were uh, allowed to make happen for me. So I appreciate that. Um, but speaking of that, what I want to point out next, and we talked about this a little bit beforehand, and we've had this conversation many times. You and I have one fundamental flaw, which is that we want to hire assistant editors that don't want to be assistant editors. We want to find people that really want to cut so we can mentor and we can help them grow, which means we always have to keep looking for good assistant editors, which is really yes. frustrating. And I partly learned that from you, but there, there's a method to the madness. So why won't you just hire somebody that you can keep under your wing forever? Uh, because, listen, you know, I mean, it's a good, it's a good question. It's not that I, it's not that I wouldn't, because like I said, I, I have some friends that are sort of those lifetime uh, assistants, but you know what I mean? Like they tend to be, you know, like I said, they tend to be more than nine to fives, which, you know, which I'm, I'm fine with, but you know, I, I tend to work on, on shows that need those little sort of extra touches, you know, um, they're not, they're not easy sort of necessary to put together. So in the sense that, you know, I mean, I need a little bit more. And so I, I catch myself, you know, like I get I get more excited when I when I see that excitement of somebody who's sort of young and hungry. You know, like I've got a very simple approach when it comes to it, because I, I, you know, I get the I get your type of calls a lot. And, you know, now it's you know easier to have phone calls and sort of get together beyond just the pandemic stuff. But but uh, um but what what I do is, you know, I give them the playbook. It's the playbook that's worked for almost every assistant, you know, that I that I've hired. Which is, if you're starting from nothing, you know, you, you gotta go, you gotta go into the reality world. You know, you, you you gotta you gotta make all your calls and you gotta figure out a way. I mean, I I can sort of introduce you to some people that are in that world and and see if there's there's you know they can keep their ears and eyes open. But get yourself in that reality world you know, get, you know, get abused, but trust me, this, the abuse you're going to get there, you're going to literally come back and you're going to be like, I know you're road tested when you've sort of gone through that. And the people that have reached out to me and sort of followed that, that playbook, uh, every single one of them, uh, they have had success. You know I mean? It, it, it wasn't one of those, like, 
I can't, you know, I, I can't make it happen. I can't, you know, what, what I ended up doing though is, you know, cause it's always one of those keep, you know, keep in contact with me, let me know how things are going. You know, So, you know, the ones that are really serious because they actually follow up, you know, uh, uh, six months from now you hear from them again. Hey, just want to let you know, I'm doing this show. I'm doing this, blah, blah, blah. You know, fantastic. You know, and then all of a sudden you get that call. Hey, I'm looking for an assistant, you know, like, you know, anybody sort of young, I said, you know, I'm like, you know, I mean, I said, I've been talking with this person. I, I feel I've got a good feeling about them, you know, but, you know, but why don't you meet with them and see, you know, with the understanding that at some point I might steal them back because, you know, if I'm looking for, you know, these are, these are people that I, I, I feel like I, you know, I put the time in, in terms of getting them sort of, you know, mentally sort of ready for, for what it, what it kind of takes. So, um, I've had really good success when it, in, in that sort of sense of, you know, and, and it's, like I said, it's a constant sort of getting those phone calls. What do I need to do here? You know, let me introduce you to these three assistant, you know, editors that I know, you know, that I, that basically follow this playbook and have had a lot of good success for it, you know, call them and, and everybody like everybody's been, you know, is always good in terms of taking those phone calls and, and and helping out and that's that's one of those things and i i try to like emphasize like the importance of that because it really is you know because i do it without an agent you know never you know i've never had the agent and never done that I, it's sort of the goodwill of of the you know the creators the writers and uh, and people and all that's that i've that i've worked with that i've been sort of for, fortunate to sort of keep it you know but uh, uh but then and, and the most important thing i want to say because i always like you know, when I have these conversations with assistants, you know, like I, I always stress, like the, the most important thing you need to remember is we work in a very you know, creative field, you know, and everyone needs to feel like they're part of the process, you know, because it's so easy, especially as an editor, you know, obviously I'm, you know, I'm one of those who tries to get the show 90% there in the editor's cut, because I believe if my editor's cut is close, then that director and producer's cut, God, that can go so smoothly and easily as compared to, and I get it, you know, uh, you know, some people like, you know, they put it together and they wait for someone to give them direction. And then, it, you know, it keeps getting better and it keeps getting better. And then by the time you lock it, it's, it's there. But, you know, like, I don't necessarily wait. I like, you know, I can problem solve. I, I know where the issues are. You know, I, I, I you know, I, I try and get this, this thing close, but, you know, but, uh, but you also got to remember that it is a process. So, you know, I mean, even though I think this editor's cut is, you could basically lock this thing tomorrow and air it the next day and it's, and it's never going to get better. You know, uh, sometimes you nail things and sometimes you don't, you know, and it's not a fight of, oh no, this is the only way it's, it needs to be done. It's, oh, I, I you know what? I know what you're saying. I, I, what, you tell me what you don't, what you're not liking right now. And let me see how I can solve it, you know? And, you know, I mean, when I figured that out, I really did sort of, to me, the process got even better because I was one of those guys that used to fight. Oh my God. You know, it was, you know, in terms of just really making sure that my cut was, was the one that sort of survived. And, and then, it, you know, and then I realized, I don't know if I was that, that much fun in the editing room for sometimes with, and I, I was told that once or twice and, and you, and then you know, I said those are those things where you realize, oh, I don't, I don't want it to be a unpleasant experience. So let me, let me figure out a way to, to, to figure this out. So you know, it's, it's the one thing I try and stress to the assistants early on is just, just remember that, you know, it's a, a very creative process, and we got, you got to make sure everyone feels like they're, they're part of that process. You and I are very much the same as far as the editor's cut philosophy, where similar to you, I'm going to give them what I think is airable. I'm going to deliver the editor's cut. And my dream, by the way, is to go from editor's cut to lock just like you. <laughs> Don't think I'm ever going to achieve it, but boy, is that the dream. The point being, that's the mentality of how I'm putting an editor's cut together. The sound and the music and every cut perfect. And I'm, it's not like, here's this kind of a rough assembly. What do you think? It's more, here, air this. You got a problem with it? Tell me what you want to fix, but air this, right? <laughs> <laughs> you and I have a similar philosophy. What I'm curious to, to learn more about, I want to dive into this idea of the playbook a little bit deeper. I love this concept of the playbook. There's two sections of the playbook that I think are really important to cover. The first of which, let's assume that I'm the person that's done all the reality. I've got my hours. I've paid my dues. 
if I want to get your attention or somebody similar to you, but I don't have the experience, what do I need to tell you to get over the hump of, you know what, this person's never done scripted, but I think they can and I'm willing to take the chance. What as, is the as an assistant editor? Are you talking about as an assistant if editor? You're, if you're an assistant in reality, you don't have any scripted experience. People believe, I can't do it without scripted experience. It's a catch-22. What do I need to tell you to convince you otherwise? Well, I, I mean, let's see. Me personally, you don't have to tell me anything because I don't like the – whether I've done scripted or not, like I know you're road tested because – what the scripted, I mean, what the reality world is doing compared to what we're doing, it's a cakewalk. You know what I mean? Like, you, I mean, you guys, are, you know, they're, you know, in that scripted world, like they're 10 years ahead of us in terms of everything is finished. You know, they're finishing in that room. They're doing sound. They're doing all of that stuff. They're working with, you know, five editors at a time. Like now you're telling me you're going to come and work on a one-on-one -on -one relationship with like me and all of that energy that you put, were putting in, in terms of, you know, working over multiple like editors, like I'm going to get that, all that focus myself. Like it really, it really, it, you don't have to convince me, you know, uh, uh, too much with that. Um, when it comes to the assistant editor, you know, like I said, I don't think that's a, uh, that's a problem at all. It just comes down to what you're sort of comfortable with, because obviously when you're dealing with that, you're also dealing with, you know, like, you know, not from the, obviously the technical aspect of it, you don't, but you do, you know, when it comes to the cutting, because obviously it's like, oh, I want to cut, I want to do this, I want to do that. Then you start throwing them some, you know, some scenes, you let them do the sound stuff, you know, you get, you know, all the stuff that you don't want to do. Um, and then you start letting them cut. And that's the cutting is where it, it always like, you know, that's where you go, oh, okay, this person like, you know, like I, I've definitely had the assistance where you, you were one of the first things you get from them, you're like, oh shit, this guy can cut, you know, like, oh, he's, he's good. You know, like, like, which is kind of like, oh, thank God. And then there's other times where you're just like, eh, okay, you know, like we're going to, we're going to have to dig in because, you know, it's easy to take a scene away and just fix it, you know, but they don't learn too much, you know? So I try, you know, I might be the hands, but I'll try and get them to come in the room. Hey, let's sit down. Let's talk about it. You know, uh, I like what you did here. You know, this moment here, I don't feel like we're being realized. It, it, nothing, it's, you know, like, remember, we're talking about this, this, and that. So I do try and, you know, like I said, be able to sort of talk through exactly what it is, what I'm liking or what I, I don't like. And then, you know, at a certain point, too, like I always like to try to remind is, I go, listen, at a certain point, it's going to come down to individual taste, you know, like it's not that it's not working here, but I don't like doing these type of cuts, you know, or I don't like jumping the line in this sort of way. Um, if I, you know, if I give this scene to, you know, if I, if we're, if we're both cutting the same scene, it's not going to be exactly the same. Hopefully the, you know, the idea of the scene is going to be the same, but it's not going to be cut by cut. So, you know, I mean, I, I always try to encourage where you think I might've destroyed this scene. Meaning like, you know, like I just took it away and just kind of, and, but I mean, it doesn't mean you were wrong. It just means this is how I like to sort of do things, you know, but, and these are the things that you can sort of work on or, and not work on. So, you know, like I, I, I always try and make it a, a, a learning experience. Um, and, and when we talk about like what we talk about in terms of that editor's cut, I, you know, I need those assistants that are willing to kind of, you know, to go that sort of extra mile because there's no way to do an editor's cut like that unless you kind of have have that type of assistant kind of working with you too. You know? Yeah, I think that a, a huge point that I always emphasize to people is the quality of my assistant editor dictates the quality of my life while I'm on a show. If yes. I have to manage everything about them and walk them through the process and basic issues aren't done and I have to cut all my scenes and do all my sound design, my life is hell. I yeah. want a creative partner where some other editors, they just want to hoard all of the work, do everything. You know what? Do my dailies, do my exports, do my visual effects list. I can't even imagine working that way because I'd work 90 hours a week. Yeah. I said, I, I don't understand because, uh, you know, the, the, the thing that's cr that that I laugh about now, because when I meet, the, you know, these young guys. So when I talk about like, so what sort of experience of, you know, you know, Avid Premier, you know, I mean, they're like, you know, <laughs> the knowledge that they have now compared to like what I had when I started, I mean, I literally opened up that Avid book from page one and it was a thick book and I just turned the page and just kind of looked at the windows and, you know what I mean? Like just from the technical aspect and meanwhile, like nowadays, you know, the, you know, they have just as much knowledge as, as I do. They don't realize how much sort of knowledge it is. Sometimes I have to remind them like, 
okay, either you're a visual effects editor or you're an editor. Like in theory, you could be both, but do you want to spend 90 hours a week doing, trying to do everything? Like it's, you know I mean? Like I love cutting, you know, like I love doing music, you know, the rest of it. It's like, I need, I need an assistant who can, who's really good with sound. I need, you know, an assistant who can cut where I can throw them scenes and know I'm going to get something back. That's in decent shape. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it's, it's truly like when I'm, when I'm meeting with people and talking, I know exactly what to ask and I can tell right away, like, okay, this person, you know, it's got the, it definitely has the potential because when they say, oh, I don't know anything about visual effects or eh, I'm not much of a sound guy, then it's like, you know, nice meeting you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't know about that. Yeah, it's like those are the type of things where you're just like, okay, yeah, but, you know, thanks for, you know. Nice yeah, not, not a good fit. So. I'm right there with you. Uh, what I always emphasize is that number one, your job is to make this person's life easier in whatever way you possibly can. And what you also need to emphasize, and this is something I tell all of my students, you don't need to know everything because the people that are in reality, they're thinking, I just, I don't understand turnovers and this and that. It's like, it doesn't matter. Do you know enough to not get fired on the first day? That's sure. it. Show up and know enough. You can learn everything else on the fly. If you're a problem solver and you can work hard, you don't need to know everything. You can learn it. Just be in a position where you can succeed your first day. From there, everything else will happen. That, and I find that that's been good, useful advice for people that just feel like, oh, I'm not ready yet. Like, you're never going to be ready. I wasn't ready to cut burn notice. Are you kidding? I was completely out of my league, but I figured it out. Yes, but uh, you want to, we're going to jump back for a second because when I, when I used to run post, here's the thing that I, I did used to like. So obviously when you're, when you're working in post-production, when you're working with a, a post producer who nine times out of 10 knows nothing about the ins and outs of post, they don't realize like, oh, I, I totally fucked up this output. Like shit, like 30 minutes into you're like, oh fuck, I got to start this thing over. Uh, um, so, you know, then they come in, Hey, what's going on? Oh, system crashed. You know, like, uh, I, you know, I gotta, you know, I gotta start over. It's going to take another hour, you know, like those are those moments where it was like, what the fuck did you just do? Like, I, like, I know you, you, you know, like, what did you forget to do? Because there's no way the system, there's no way to tell me this, the system crashed. There's, those are those sort of moments where, you know, that you could sort of get away with, uh, with things that you normally can't when you don't have someone who's a, a creative person in terms of posts. Cause you know, like, cause you were talking about as long as you don't get fired on that first day. I mean, yes, those are the type of things where, you know, the technical aspects can be learned very, very quickly. You know, the rest of the stuff, like I said, I, I, I don't mind, I don't mind teaching any of that stuff. I just need to know you have a general, you know, understanding of, of what of what it is that it takes you know and 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 you're willing to sort of work hard enough to you know to figure that stuff out now i want to dive into one of the biggest conflicts with the way that our departments are organized and again you're a very unique person that can, they can look at it from both perspectives as an editor you have a very specific need for an assistant that has a drive to do creative work, that wants to go above and beyond, that wants to do the sound design, maybe wants to do 10 visual effects, cut a scene here or there to offload your workload, co-producer doesn't care. The co-producer has the assistant editor for very specific purposes that frankly have nothing to do with the editor. And as you know, there is a lot of conflict between the producer and the editor, and the assistant is stuck in between both of them serving two completely different masters. Sure. So how, how do you manage that both as an editor, as an assistant editor and a co-producer? Because it's, it's a very fragile relationship that I've seen lead to people not being a part of a team because one of the three pieces didn't fit. Yeah, I mean, you know, and I feel like during our period when we were working together, that was, that was sort of an issue because, you know, it was bad enough that it was a two editor, two assistant, but it was like, okay, we'll give you a three editor, but you're only going to have two assistants, which means some, you know, some assistant has to share, uh, uh, you know, uh, the responsibility with the third editor, which, you know, like a show like that, it was all like, I used to, sometimes I used to say it's almost easier with a, a two on two, because at least it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. You know what I mean? We're, we're, we're in this battle together in a three on two. And thank God that world has pretty much gone away. I haven't been in one of those situations in a long time, nor do I think I'd let myself be into one of those situations. That, that's like one of those things where you say, well, what's going to decide? Like, yeah, that's one of those things where it's like, yeah, I'm not working on that show. But, 
but yes, I mean, that's a, that's a tough position to be in. I mean, listen, at the end of the day, you know, uh, I can do my own sound. I could do my own, uh, uh, uh music. I, I mean, I, in theory, I could do everything if I had to. And there's, there's sometimes there's, you know, I've been in those not recently, but where it's like, okay, I'm just going to have to dive in here and do a little bit more than sort of expected. Um, because it, it, like I said, it isn't fair. Cause I, you know, obviously you, you always have the assistant who's willing to kind of go that extra mile. I'll take care of this sort of after, but it's like, you know, dude, I don't want you to be here until midnight. And I don't want, you know I mean? Like there's, you know, there will be conversations that I'll have just to say, Hey, you know, what, what's the importance here? Because I've got a cut that's going out. I need, you know, I need this, this, and that. I, I feel like when you have those conversations, um, you, you know what I mean? You can, you know, you can usually figure out a workaround or, or a workflow that can, that sort of can benefit both. But, you, you know, you gotta, you, you gotta have those conversations instead of those, those shouting matches of, you know, I'm not being supported and all of that crazy and nonsense. Yeah. I've, I've been in the middle of uh, more than one of those as I'm sure you have as well. So the second part of the playbook that we haven't talked about yet, which I think you can provide so much insight into first part of the playbook. How do I just break into scripted? The second part is more complex. I'm a highly skilled assistant editor. Maybe I've cut a bunch of scenes. Maybe I even have an additional editor credit, a co-editor credit or two. I just can't get the chair. I cannot Mm -hmm. get that first season. What do I need to do to make that happen? I know those are those are tough ones because I like I said I've there's a I've got a couple of those, you know that I that I still sort of talk with and it's it's so weird how those you know some some of those opportunities just open up just perfectly, for some people and others it just you know it it just for whatever reason it just doesn't happen as simple, um, you know it, it's frustrating because obviously the idea of you know you always like I got to go back to that first season show to sort of hope for that you know for that 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 opportunity again you know i i wish i mean i wish i had a better you know uh, a uh, a better answer but in you know but in terms of that it's you just gotta it's the persistence part of just you know of of not sort of just giving up and 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 like I said you know setting yourself up for that that opportunity so when it comes it just doesn't go away but you know, I mean, you know, you know, it's one thing about getting that that first credit or that first season, but you know, but the show goes away and all of a sudden it's like I'm back to sort of square one, you know. So at the end of the day, I think, you know, the there's enough opportunities. And like I said, it might not happen right away, but I mean the the opportunity the opportunity will come again. And and if it's a right fit, it's just it's it's gonna happen. You know, uh, you know, you just gotta, you gotta believe ultimately that it's going to happen. As a supervising editor that hires younger editors, especially ones that were your own little uh, underlings as assistants, but let's say that there wasn't uh, somebody that you brought up from assistant, they're just a young editor with maybe a season at the most. Let's say you don't have a relationship with them. What do I need to do to convince you that I can do a season of TV knowing that I've been a highly skilled assistant. I've worked on great shows. I've done some of my own cutting. As you know, a lot of it isn't credited. What do I need to do to convince you that I can sit in that chair and I can do a season? <laughs> um, it's really going to come down to personality. You know what I mean? Like, it, you know, I like, cause obviously we're going to just sit down and we're going to have a, a conversation kind of like with you, you know what I mean? And I'm going to be able to feel out and assess, you know, we're going to talk movies, you know what I mean? We're going to like, I, I'm going to kind of push, push your buttons a little bit in terms of, you know, to, to make sure that we're sort of on a similar sort of, uh, uh, uh wavelength in terms of, you know, the, the type of material that we're going to, you know, like, obviously, it's going to depend on the show, too. So, you know, I'm going to have a, a very specific, I mean, I can give a good a good example in terms of like, the what we're working on now, you know, uh, the, the the third editor spot ended up being uh, uh, hired, we hired a guy who very familiar with his work, but never worked with before. So, it, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it, it works both ways, you know, like, you know, he has, a, he had a great, rep, a great reputation, Lance Lucky. Um, and so it was one of those, you know, you know, somewhat similar, you know, he happened to reach out to me when we were, you know, when we were sort of looking and it was like, Oh my God, Lance, you're available. I said, you know what, uh, do me a favor, you know, send me your resume. Cause 
you know, it was one of those things where perfect drama, you know, I mean, uh, action, comedy kind of had a little bit of, of everything. And it was one of those, like, this is exactly what, what we're looking for in terms of, 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 uh, for an editor. So, I mean, in t- that's in terms of someone with, a, with with credits. If you don't have the credits, but you have the passion, listen, you know what I mean? You know me. So it's like, it's not going to be as difficult um, in the sense that like, I'm willing to sort of uh, uh, to take a chance, but I can see where, you know, without sort of the credits, you know, you're, you're going to be in a situation um, where it, it might be a little bit tougher, but, you know, I, I think kind of like what you, what you sort of did, you know, you need to sort of assess out, you know, what you're, you know, who you're sort of dealing with in terms of maybe, the, you know, credits that they've worked on the shows that, that they've worked on, you know, like, you know, we, uh, some of the interviews we had, uh, one of the, the editors it sent me a really nice note in terms of a show that I worked on, you know, which was, you know what I mean? Like it was a while ago, but I, I really appreciated the sentiment of just, you know what I mean? Of taking the time, uh, doing the little bit of research, you know, uh, being able to sort of break down and, and talking about, uh, the episode and, and, and this, you know, the scene, um, the way they did. So it's that type of stuff. It's, it's, it's the details. I mean, listen, at a certain point, you know, you have, you know, you know, obviously when I go in for interviews, you know, the resumes is, is there, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, there's, there's not that many, I mean, you know, usually I'm already, you know, I've been recommended, so it's not as pressured as it might be, um, uh, uh for, you know, for someone who's just, you know what I mean? Trying to kind of, kind of get that break. But I, I think it's those type of, those type of details, you know, um, of kind of trying to trying to figure out uh, the world you're stepping into, the you know the type of person that you're you might be meeting with. I think those are the things that you know. I mean, listen, not you know, the, the internet's a beautiful thing. You can Google almost anything, so you could you know you can find out. And I've I've caught my like I've done that a lot of times. You know, like sometimes I think it's worked really well. You know, in terms of uh, of being able, you know, it's helped me in terms of interviews. Um, and then, but then it's funny because, you know, like I remember one of the, one of the better interviews I had with walking into a situation where I felt like, cause I didn't really know anybody. Um, it was one of those like, oh, I got this, like this one, I, I nailed this one. Like, um, I'm getting this job. Did not get this job, you know? So even sometimes when you feel like, oh, this is, this one's going to happen, you know? And then you have those ones where you're not sure about. And then by the time you, you actually get to your car, you, you know, you get the call, like, we want you and you're like, you do? <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, let's do this. You know, so, you know, it's like I said, it's sometimes it's sometimes you don't know, but but um, but I think you got to you got to put in the time to to at least, you know, set yourself up to present yourself in a way that this person that you're going to sort of excite the person you're 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 meeting with. Going back to this idea of the assistant editor trying to get into the chair, we've talked about yep. all the, the personality and the things they can bring to it and that they can convince you with. What's the bare minimum? When you say it's a deal breaker if you're not at least at this level, I don't care how passionate you are, how much research you've done on me or the show. If you're not at least here, you probably need to do more work before I'd even consider you. You're talking about getting into the chair? Into or the editor's chair. No, getting into the editor's chair. What's the bare minimum where you say, I love you. We had a great meeting, but it's it's not enough. You need to at least get to this point where I'm willing to take a chance on you to give you the editor's chair. At a minimum, you're gonna have to have cut a couple of episodes. You know, co-editing. You know, what I mean, like I get all of that stuff. You're, if you if you've got no credits, it's it's gonna be tough. I mean, if you just have assistant credits, that's that's gonna be that's gonna be a tough situation. You know, what would help is co-editing credits. But I would probably need some really good recommendations too. So, I, you know, I would need, you know, you, you would you would need to be able to have uh, an editor call me and be able to to, to have a conversation where I can kind of almost grill them to to feel like, okay, I like you, I trust you, I like your work. You know, what I mean, if you're saying these type of things, then this is something that you know that that I'm willing to listen to to more for sure. So it's like I need a couple of credits, you know, and like I, I know that's a little deceiving because listen, you know, when it comes to the credits thing, uh, you know, uh, you know, my my assistants, whenever I can get them an opportunity in terms of co-editing stuff, like I'm, 
you know, I'm, I'm totally game for it. Um, so, you know, like I know how much my assistants work and how, how, how deserving they are, you know, in terms of, of those credits. Uh, but I mean, the code anything doesn't mean anything. It's kind of like when people say, Hey, do you have a reel? And it's like, yeah, no. I mean, like, do you want to, you can watch any episode, but I could also watch you and explain to you the craziness of how I put that scene together, which is probably better than ultimately what you're seeing here or, to me, it's it's more about personality. You know what I mean? Like, can I sit in a room with this guy? You know? Now, granted, we're in a position where, in, especially in television, you know, it, it, it's not like a movie where, you know, shit, I'm going to sit with this guy for the next, you know, eight or 10 months. You know, uh, we have the luxury of every month, it's, you know, you're, you're working with a new director. And, you know, it's kind of what I love about television is no matter how good or bad it is, in a month, <laughs> you get to start the process all over again. I mean, obviously love the process, gotta love the process because you know sometimes you work on good shows and sometimes you don't you know so you know but as long as you love the process it's it's always going to be a a pleasant experience you know yeah, i'm in tv for the exact same reason because i was doing features and i'm thinking i can't work on the same 90 minute thing for six months eight months 10 months with the same people i just can't do it tv's perfect yeah. and like you said you you, you wait a month and you might have something much better. I remember on Burn Notice, no offense to Burn Notice, but I worked on my least favorite episode ever right before working on my favorite episode of the whole series. Like they actually yeah. overlap for like a week. That's what I love about TV. Like one was just like pulling teeth. Like, are they really going to air this? Like I remember thinking, <laughs> like, what are they doing? This is not the show. And then the next episode was my favorite thing ever. I'm so proud I, of it. I always remember that you had that episode where they did that whole created that whole oh the montage went, yes that was the, the opening montage was five yes i so i i remember i remember seeing it and then i think i had a conversation with matt nixon and said thank god we hired zach because if i had to do this like i think i would have quit you know like you were so young and hungry like you would have done anything and it was fantastic like it was one of those things where it was like okay this you know what I mean? Like, this is exactly like the type of person we needed for this show because unfortunately it was one of those shows where, you know, sometimes things worked brilliantly and sometimes they didn't. And then once you had to think outside the box, oh my God, that could just take you in a direction of like, forget it. You know, and Matt was so good. Like he could fix, he could fix things so easily with the voiceover, but then all of a sudden you're like, I need to put picture so this doesn't just feel like a, you know, a voiceover. So. Yeah, I've, I've done entire presentations on the before and after of just that. It's still one of the proudest moments of <laughs> my like, 20 career. Can I career. borrow that? <laughs> I'd, I'd be more than happy to, to, to let you borrow. But that was, I, I won't go too deep into it, but that was one of the proudest moments of my career where it was like all, it was like the confluence of all the experience in short form and promos and advertising and trailers and long form. And the ironic thing is that multiple people said, we're so glad you had trailer experience to put this together. When in reality was, well, he's got trailer experience. Can we really hire him? I'm like, come on. Exactly. I know. No, so, I know. It's, it's so, it's such a fine line. It re like it really is like, to me that I get excited when I see someone who has that type of diversity, you know, uh, on their, their editing resume. Cause I know how difficult it is to be able to kind of do all of that, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, it's like I said, it's a business that just constantly, you know, constantly wants to pitch and all. I mean, I, you get it, you know, I mean, you know, there's, you know, there's, there's money at stake and, you know, people like said, you're doing a comedy, like there are a lot of good half hour comedy editors out there that just love to just do that and don't want to do anything else. So, you know, it, it'd be so much easier just to, to hire one of them. But I get excited when you get those guys that, like I said, think more outside the box. And it's like, no, I want a different perspective because it's like, I can give you a different perspective. Trust me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, so the, the last question, this is going to be a total tangent segue from everything we've talked about, but it's clearly the foundation of everything I've been, uh, been building for the last several years, which is not just being successful, but doing it without losing your mind or your health in the process. <laughs> you are an incredibly hard worker, but yes. it, has, it has come at the expense of your health more than once. So would <laughs> you be sure. willing to talk, uh, talk some about the challenges that you've had with your health navigating your career? Uh, yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. 
Um, you know, uh, 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 yeah. So, I, you know, I got diagnosed with Crohn's disease, and was it God two thousand and two thousand and four? And it was, you know, it was a it was a it was a scary time for me because obviously never been sick before, and you know, and um, and you know, to you know, like I said, wake up one day, next day you're in the hospital, next day you're having surgery, and then sort of dealing with complications and all of this other stuff. Um, you know, it was a it was a a hard process in terms of, you know, of, um, of kind of getting back to sort of my healthy self and in the process, trying to continue a career, trying to sort of maintain a career, um, you know, trying to find the balance in terms of that career to sort of keep yourself, you know, uh, uh, uh healthy, um, uh, it's, you know, it's a, you know, post production is a tough, is a tough one when it comes to the, the health stuff. I mean, I obviously you're one of those guys on the forefront in terms of, you know, trying to change all that around and, you know, and, and, that, and I always appreciate all that, all that. Cause it's, you know, the patterns of post-productions, the late hours, the bad eating habits, just the, the, the sitting, you know, like uh, uh, all of that stuff is just so, you know, is, is not conducive to a, a healthy, you know, lifestyle, um, at all. And, you know, just, just those minimal amount of, of changes from the standing desk to the mats, to the, just, you know, going out and going for walks. Like I, you know, I can remember working with Peter, one of my first editors, and he used to like to do the walk thing. And, you know, I catch him, he'd just be staring, you know, and, he, and I'd be like, what are you like, what are you doing? Oh, it's good to just kind of focus in the distance on something that, you know, in terms of the eyes because of the, the eye strain and all that stuff. And, you know, you're always just like, Oh yeah, I'd never even thought of something like that, but, but he's not you know, working. He's not doing <laughs> stuff. He's wasting time. <laughs> no, but I, like, you know, and listen, you know, like it's easy to sort of get into those good and bad habits. I mean, just the, in terms of the, the stop working with the, uh, with the, uh, the pandemic. I mean, you know, I put 10 pounds on like, like that, you know what I mean? Like next thing I know, I was one of those guys that says, I'm never going to watch walking dead. Everyone keeps talking about walking dead. Like, and this, you know, next thing I know I binged like nine seasons of it. Like, in, you made it all the way through nine. Good for you. I, I made it. I gave up. Yeah I, made it, yeah. I mean, it was one of those, like, I basically got to the point where it's like, okay, I, you know, I, I got what I need. I think, I feel like I'll get back to it eventually, maybe, but, they, they but I got them. sort of what I, yeah, I got what I sort of needed out of it ultimately. But, uh, you know, next thing you know, I'm just notching, I'm doing this, I'm, you know, so, you know, uh, in terms of the, the, the health aspect, yeah, I, it's, it's a little bit of a battle. I mean, obviously, you know, uh, I feel good, feel great now. Um, you know, try and be conscious about all of that, uh, about all of that stuff. But, uh, but at times it can be very, very difficult. Yeah, I don't think I've ever worked with anybody that has the level of hyper-focus that you do. I think the only person that could maybe compete with you is me. Other than that, you, like you would just come in and when I say come into the job, you'd mosey in, you know, 1130, 12 o'clock, maybe one o'clock, <laughs> totally on your own schedule. But oh, then totally. I, I remember the few late nights that I had because I would come a lot earlier because I had kids. But yes. there were some times that I would stay late and I'd walk out the door at 1 a.m. There you are. Light's still on. You're just cut the way I'd come say hi and you're just in it. So what's what's the line for you? Where do you say, you know what? I do got to watch out for what I'm doing and I need to be careful of my health because I know you've crossed that line more than once. Like, How do you know yourself as somebody with such crazy hyper focus? As much as I want to cut, I got to step away. This is this is kind of my 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 line that I don't want to cross. Yeah, I, I mean it's 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 interesting because there was a period where, you know, uh, I, I mean it's it's probably true, but I felt like I did my best work after six p.m. You know, there was like you know because I, I would I'm one of those later guys, right? That you know, but there's just so many distractions. There's so many things kind of going on. Then all of a sudden, everyone starts to disappear around six o'clock, and and all of a sudden, my focus is just there. And then I'm just off to the races, you know. So, you know, it's I, I battled myself in terms of trying to reprogram and say, you know, it's not the reality is if I can just if I can sort of focus myself. So when I step in, I'm just kind of going there's no reason to have to go to do these sort of late, late hours. So, you know, um, uh, I, you know, like it's, it's been interesting because obviously now being able to work straight from home and going from the bedroom into an office, 
you know, now I sit here and go, Ooh, this is, you know, I mean, this is the situation I think I've been waiting for my entire life, you know, which is very like, dangerous. It, Cause it's very it, addicting. It is, you know, so it's like, you know, and I've had those conversations. How long is this going to, you know, how long do you think this is going to go on? I said, it's going to go on for, you know, if a, it makes, it makes viable sense for, you know, financially for the studios networks, you know, it's going to depend on who you're working with because, you know, a lot of the younger uh, 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 showrunners, they don't, they don't care if they're sitting there in an office that, you know, you know, some of the older ones, they definitely like the idea of being able to be in the room, but you know, if anything, I feel like I'm used to, I'm working with the directors more than I probably ever have because it's so easy for them to say, Hey, I got a couple of minutes. Can we look at some things? And it's like, yeah, let's jump into the Evercast room and I'll show you some stuff, you know? Um, but, you know, let's jump back into the, the health stuff, man. It's, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's, that's really a tough one. Like I, you know, I, I, yeah, I have my good times and I, and I, I have my, my, my bad periods for sure. So, you know, that, that's a constant sort of battle, but, um, but in terms of just the actual time part of it, and I, you know, I, I've, I've literally done everything where it's like, I start early in the morning, I do the late night stuff. I mean, you know, I will say this, you know, having a little bit more, uh, you know, um, luxury in terms of when you're doing the supervising editing, um, um, being able to not have to carry all this sort of responsibility, you know, I mean, those are the things where, you know, trying to have the, be healthier on that side of it with relationships too, you know what I mean? You know, in a new relationship, you know, making sure I'm, you know I mean? I'm, I'm putting in my time and it's not all about the work because, you know, at a certain point it's just television. You know I mean, it's, it's fun and it's exciting, but it, you know, but there's a lot more to it too. So, you know, I, I, I really do try and make sure I balance, you know, all of it. When I have the money, I'm going to create an entire billboard that says, at a certain point, dot, 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 it's just television. If we could just get everyone else to understand that, I, it wouldn't I be so hard. I know. And then, like I said, and there's so much of it out there now, too, that it's so crazy because you really, you know, you work so hard on these sometimes and you're so excited. And then, you know, like I said, some things take off and other things are just, you know, they come and they go, you know, and you're just like, boy, I thought that was going to go be bigger or that was going to be you know better. And, you know, but but like I said, but the beauty of it is there's, there's always another show and there's always these other relationships. So. Which is why one of the things you said is so important. It's all about the process because you can yes. work for months and months and months and months. And guess what? It's a thumbnail on Netflix. That's it. It's one thumbnail. So you better enjoy the process because if you're hoping that it's going to lead to something else or be big or whatever it is, you got to love the process. Listen, if you do not like the intricate of post-production, if you don't like, I mean, obviously we don't have to worry about the technical side, but I, I like to geek out and, and get a, you know, the understanding of, of all of it. You know, it's funny. I, uh, I was talking with a, a high school friend of mine who reminded me of one of my first sort of editing projects that I did with him. We had to do like this commercial uh, for some like product. It was like a business class we were taking in high school. We had to do this commercial for this product that we were trying to sell. And I had him come over the house. I had two, uh, uh, two forehead VCRs set up with, the, and I, and I bought a microphone that I plugged in and we basically, I dubbed movies from, you know, all, all of our favorite movies. And we just re-recorded the dialogue with, you know, you know, pitching this, you know, this, these product ideas. And, and I remember him saying to me, what the hell are you doing right now? Like, I don't understand. Like, how do you know how to do this? And it's just like, Oh, I don't know. I mean, you just, you know, do it's the, just the thing. so it's like, it was one of those things where, you know, it was a, a process that's, you know, either you, you, either you love it or you don't. I mean, there's no sort of faking it because I've definitely, obviously I've worked with assistants and editors, you know, where you could tell it was a nine to five job, which is great. But then, you know, you, you, you don't, you know, like, cause obviously you can make, a good living as an assistant editor, you can make a good living, you know, good living as an editor. Um, so, you know, if, if that's all, if that's what you want it to be, that's, you know, that's fine. But if you want to do the advancements and you want to, you know, become an editor and then, you know, then you have the editors who want to become directors and, you know what I mean? So it's, it's one of those things where, you know, it, it, it the, there has to be a love of that process. Otherwise, you know, you'll never get those opportunities and, 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 and breaks. So final question for you. I'm very curious about this one because I definitely don't know the answer. 
is somebody like me who loves the challenge, who gets bored with doing things that they get good at. Now that you've reached the point of supervising editor, managing a whole bunch of other editors, working on big shows, what's next for you? It's a good question. I mean, you know, the the directing aspect is something that I always keep in the back of my mind. I mean, you know, I I, I wrestle a little bit with it. It's, you know, I, I think... I think ultimately I feel like I'm going to need to challenge myself and that, that might be, that might be the next step. Um, but, you know, but I will say supervising editing is a nice position. You know, it, it sort of gives me that balancing act that I've, I feel like I've worked for a while to sort of achieve. And at the end of the day, I do love, like I love the editing room. I love that process. I mean, I've been on the set, you know, you, you know what I mean? I've been on, 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 on all aspects of it and that I can get bored very quickly in that world. Like I love the material when it's already there, you know, I mean, I'll yell at it and it makes, and it frustrates the hell out of me, but I, you know, I mean, in terms of the way my brain works, you know, like that's where I'm at my, my most comfortable, but, it, but I do keep the directing thing in the, in the, in the back of my mind. Cause I, you know, I think it's the logical sort of, of, of next step, uh, if, you know, if I, if I want to. Well, I'm going to pencil in a podcast in a year or two to help people understand the transition from editing to directing even better. So we'll, we'll, we'll have to put that, put that on the calendar. Perfect. Uh, that having been said, this has been a tremendous pleasure. It was everything I hoped it would be and more for the years and years I wanted to get you on the microphone. I'm glad we could finally make it happen. Do you have any other final thoughts, anything else that you want to share that you think is necessary for people to hear that want to move forwards, that want to grow themselves that want to take the next steps in their career? Have we missed any final nuggets of wisdom? Uh, the persistence part is really, you know, you know, I mean, it's, it is one of those things that you, you, you gotta, I mean, it's, it's easy. It's easy to sort of put yourself out there, you know, like you did. And, you know, like a lot of people that sort of reach out to me, but you, you know, you got to continue with the follow-up too, you, you know, like I, I get, obviously you don't want to pester people, you know, but I think it's important that once you start getting those, you remind people that you are sort of, um, uh, you are taking those steps and, or you're, you remind people that you're, you know, you're, you're, you're taking those positive steps to make things happen because those are the things that do sort of excite me and, and, you know, will keep me in your, uh, will, I'll remember when people are, will happen to call and say, hey, you know, I'm looking for an assistant. Do you know, you know, do you know anybody? Or even just a show, hey, uh, you know, a, uh, you know, we're looking for an editor, any recommendation. So, you know, like I said, it's, it's, it's the, the reminding people, which, you know, even myself, I, you know, I mean, like, obviously, I'm fortunate enough that I, I tend to get the, you know, I get the calls. Um, but you know, but I do try when I do have those downtimes, I catch myself a lot reaching out to people that I haven't in a while. Just say, Hey, I mean, I'm out here. I'm not necessarily looking, but just wanted to say hi and check in and see how you're doing or you know, what you've been working on and, and what's sort of going on that type of stuff. So, so the persistence part and the, you know, and, and letting, letting people know, you know, even if it's just the, you know, the, the minor sort of detail, cause it's, it's easy to send a text, easy to send an email just to say, Hey, just letting you know I'm working on so-and-so and, you know, if you hear of anything, just let me know. Cause it, you'd be surprised. Like, I feel like there's been a lot of times where someone has sent me something and within a couple of days, something just happens to at least come out. I mean, not that they've gotten a job over it, but at least I've been able to recommend they've gotten an interview, that type of thing where, you know, where it, it, like it, it's easy to just, you know, to, to remember somebody when they're fresh, when you, when you're sort of taking that effort of reaching out and sort of checking in. Yep. I always tell people they're not necessarily going to recommend or hire the most qualified candidate. They're going to recommend the most recent one. Oh yeah. I just talked to this yeah. guy the other day. Right. And yep. I always teach my students, I have a, an entire flow chart, which probably doesn't surprise you a whole flow chart and a whole system. <laughs> I call it the Andy Dufresne technique because yeah. it goes back to Andy Dufresne wanting to get the money for the library in Shawshank. He just sent the letter yeah. every week, every week, every week, years later, stop sending us these letters. Here's your damn library and all your money, right? Sure. You got you got to be polite and you have to be patient. You also have to be persistent. So yes, we're, on, we're totally on the same page. Um, speaking Good. of being patient, you've been on the microphone for just short of two hours and I want to want to thank you for that and appreciate your patience. This is <laughs> really been two hours. It has been almost two hours. 
Um, so no question at this point, we've got ourselves a full on two part episode for sure. Uh, but this has been a tremendous pleasure. Um, I'm just going to say it on the record right now. I owe you a tremendous debt of gratitude because you are one of the people that recognized that I could do this and I could do it at a high level. And without you making the recommendation, I would be telling very different stories about my career right now. I know I would have figured it out and I know I would have made it, but you oh, you me make it. So. Yes. I mean, and there's no doubt you, you would have figured it out because you were one of those guys, but trust me, you were one of those people that, you know, that I'm, I, I get very, I'm very happy and excited in the way that things have sort of worked out for you because like you, you take it beyond anything that I would have ma- imagined, you know I mean? Like you're, you know, what you've done in terms of post-production and trying to take it to that next level, like, I don't know where you have the energy from. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I know about the hyper-focus thing, but I'm really good about hyper-focusing on one thing and you seem to be able to kind of take that to the, the next level. So, you know, congratulations in terms of everything that's sort of happened for you and it couldn't have happened to a better person. Well, I very much appreciate that. On that note, if somebody listening says, man, I got to connect with this guy, what's the best <laughs> way that somebody can reach out to you? And I promise you're not going to get a deluge of messages, but there might be one or two. <laughs> somebody wants to connect sure. with you. How can they do that? Uh, they can always send an email. You know, I, I don't know. Do you provide emails and stuff like that? How does That's that work? up to you. I provide emails if you say that it's okay to provide emails. Yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever email you have for me, the Gmail e- email address, you can always, you can always send that out. All right. Well, then I will make sure that anybody that's listening that wants to do their due diligence, go to the show do, notes. Do you, do I say, do you want me to give a, an, an email? You tell me if, just, you, if you if you want to. You can just give it now. I'll definitely put it in the show notes. Uh, wh- whatever it is that you want to provide. Oh, uh, Stephen Lang 9 at gmail.com. So you've that's, at least you've the, at least made the the migration from AOL to Gmail. That's good news because I still have your AOL uh, account. Oh, trust me, it's like one of those I can't get rid of it at this point now, you know. But uh, and when it does make its comeback, and it will be any minute now, <laughs> uh, I, I am prepared. <laughs> Love it. All right. Well, this has been absolutely awesome. Beyond my wildest dreams, cannot thank you enough once again. So uh, thanks for being here. Thanks, Zach.